Welcome to another of NJPM's webinars. Uh, today's topic is matrimonial, closely held business valuations in a post-COVID world. And our presenter is Jeff Erbach. So uh, Jeff has over 40 years of experience in financial forensics, divorce taxation, business valuation, and general accounting. Jeff's been qualified in New Jersey courts as an expert witness in financial forensics and business valuation. He's a graduate of Temple University and got his MBA from Rutgers. So welcome, Jeff. So first, Thank a few you. things. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. I will be monitoring that and be forwarding those questions or asking those questions to Jeff. It may not always be immediately, but we will be covering those questions. Now, just I want to also bring up a technical point, which is uh, Zoom and other organizations that put on these kinds of webinars recommend that people uh, using them, either participants or actually viewers too, always connect by ethernet cable to their router. And I wanna give you another good reason to do that. <laughs> Morning, I had my 100 feet of ethernet cable, which I connected to the router, which is down in my family room. I go all the way upstairs with it. I hooked it up, it works fine. Then the Wi-Fi out of my router failed. So if, if I hadn't hooked it up and been using ethernet, um, we might not be seeing Jeff today. So with that technical pitch, over to you, Jeff. All right, let me go into screen sharing mode. Carl, are we good? Are you seeing the uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, okay, I great. Am. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, this is a somewhat um, uh, technical presentation. Um, uh, I reviewed the slides with Carl, uh, I guess it was last week. Uh, and I, I've been, we have a, a long running thing. Uh, I've been teaching for NGAPM and, and other organizations for, for many years. And I inevitably always have way too many slides and everyone tells me to cut them, cut, cut back on them. It's just, that's just the way I am. Um, I like to have more information than less. So what we're gonna be doing today is, um, I, I've got a lot of slides here, and I, Carl, correct, I, I believe that you're gonna be making this available, uh, um, a power, the, the, either a PowerPoint or a PDF, I think, when we're done? Uh, yes, I will be putting on a Dropbox and sending out a link so that everybody who wants it can download it. Great. Okay, so then uh, we're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of slides here that uh, I'm just gonna be somewhat glossing over, um, but they're there to provide the background uh, for, uh, what, for, for ultimately for what we're gonna get to towards the end of the presentation, which is uh, taking a look at some new ways in this, in this environment that we're in to structure matrimonial settlements of, of uh, and how to handle the, the business valuation side of it. So um, that being said, okay, standard disclaimer. Um, okay, so what are our teaching objectives today is, are, are as follows. Um, I, I have to spend a little bit of time uh, and, and indulge me if you will on some of the background of, of what we do as professional business appraisers or valuation experts um, so that you understand some of the concepts that we have to deal with and, and what's required in, in the technical aspects of our work um, and the intersection now of what those concepts are and what we're dealing with in, in this COVID world that, that we're all in. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna be taking a look at what's known as the standard of value uh, the premise of value, and this concept, which we never never really had to deal with, except in very unique circumstances, concept of subsequent events, or expressed another way, what is known or knowable at the time of valuation. Um, 
the and so we're going to be looking at at how all of those things now intersect with these challenges that COVID-19 are presenting and then what we're going to do is the last nine or ten slides or so, or so I'm going to be positing for your consideration that um, we we start we, we at least consider the use of what's uh, the, the venerable earnout method or model, which is really taken from the world of M&A or mergers and acquisitions. Um, it's extremely common in the world of, of uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions to, to have a methodology to address the, um, uh, the, the fact that, that uh, the, the, the buyer and the seller oftentimes are, are, are somewhat separated and they want a way, both sides want a way to, um, to if, if from the buyer side to, to maximize their value and from the seller side not to overpay. And so a very common uh, methodology that's used out in the real world uh, where, where firms are buying and selling each other is, is the earnout method. And it's, it's certainly something that in my many years of experience has not been something in the, in the matrimonial world, but in, my, in, in the side of my practice where I'm assisting clients in, in either buying or selling a business, um, it's a very common methodology. So we're going to be exploring that and um, I'm asking you to consider that um, as just another tool in the toolbox to use uh, in these very challenging times and hopefully it's something that we're not going to have to deal with on any long-term basis but for those cases that we have um, in the pipeline right now um, it is something that uh, something to consider. All right so let's just jump right into some some basics here. This is what I'll call BV 101, understanding some important principles here. Um, every valuation has a standard of value and has a premise of value. And um, for us in, in, in New Jersey, um, our, our, our general standard of value is fair market value. Um, and that actually derives from uh, uh, in IRS ruling back in 1959, Revenue Ruling 5960, uh, which says basically it's the amount at which property would change hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller. When the former is not under any compulsion to buy, the latter is not under any compulsion to sell, and both parties have reasonable knowledge of relevant facts. Um, and that's become, uh, even though it was that this wording is actually from the IRS, that's become pretty much a standard in terms of uh, a definition of fair market value. That being said, of course, in matrimonial, there's a deviation from that. Um, and that is, um, we don't have discounts for uh, a couple things. Um, lack of marketability and lack of control. And this was, the, this was the result of a decision called Brown versus Brown back in 2002. So what that case stands for, there was a minority interest that was being valued and um, the court ruled uh, that there were, there were to be no discounts for the minority interest. And they left it open saying that, yeah, you can consider them under exceptional circumstances. And of course, that, really, that wasn't really defined. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, it's never been litigated. It would be a, clearly a very expensive proposition uh, to, to try to take up the, to, to ultimately to the appellate division and possibly even the Supreme Court. So, um, so we live in a world without discounts for minority interests until, until someone has the ability to, and the wherewithal to challenge that and, and get a more definitive ruling from, from the courts on that. The, um, the, other, um, the other thing that, that we have in, in every valuation is, is what we call the premise of value. And generally speaking, we consider the premise of value to be going concern i.e. the company is going to remain a viable ongoing entity. Um, obviously, in today's world with, with COVID-19, this is a real challenge. Um, I, I, we've all been watching the news, I'm sure, and reading the newspapers. We know so many companies uh, uh, are, 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 are not surviving um, and uh, may, may never open their doors again. So, 
we really need to consider now is uh, what we really need to consider rather is are we looking at a company that's worth is worth more dead than alive uh, should we be looking at liquidation value is the highest and best use value um, and all of these are very fact sensitive and very industry and, and uh, sensitive but um, for the first time in my many years of doing this this has become something that um, yeah, we really have to consider probably in, in more rather than less valuation situations. Is this company going to be able to, to survive? Is it going to be able, to, and if it survives, when will it be able, when will it um, get back to previous levels of, of profitability? So the premise of value is, is all of a sudden now in the forefront of our thinking uh, when, when, when we look at these, uh, when we look at these valuations. So let, let's talk about something known as the known or knowable principle. Uh, what I have here is extracted from our professional standards, but let me put it in plain English for you. And that is, it's been a long-standing practice that when we value a business, we do it as of a, a specific date. And we do it based on, obviously we're always doing it after the fact, but we do it based on what is known or knowable at the time of the valuation. Um, and there's, there's a longstanding um, in the world of federal valuations for gifts and, uh, and, and estates, uh, this has been something that has been litigated many times and, and this concept has been, been held to be um, uh, really basic to uh, all federal gift and estate valuations. And now what, what, what's happening is we have this, we have for, for those valuations that, especially those that we're doing now, we have this subsequent event called COVID-19. Well, was that known or knowable for, let's say a divorce that was filed sometime in 2019? So from a, a purely technical standpoint, um, the end, the end, we're going to be looking at this in a little bit of detail. The, the question is, well, you know, was COVID-19 known or knowable? Now, was it known or knowable as of 1231-19? Was it known or knowable in, on January 15th or February 15th or whatever? Um, these things, I, I posit, are a little more um, uh, of a concern, let's say, for a, an IRS valuation. Um, but matrimonial valuations are done in a court of equity. And courts of equity have great latitude, and uh, and with the goal being of fairness, both to the, in this case, to the business owner and the spouse, uh, the spouse would, uh, whom is get, who's getting bought out, and and so while it's nice to we we can it's nice to say oh well something is known or knowable in our opinion as of a certain date that may not be equitable and it may not be the way the court wants to look at things in the case of, of evaluation and let me just for for particularly for the the attorneys in the audience you're probably all familiar with the, with the Goldman case uh, and the Goldman case deals with uh, a subsequent event where where it was a um, car dealership which subsequently went bankrupt uh, despite the best efforts of Mr. Goldman to keep the business going. And the court in that particular case um, said, look, um, the events arose after the, the date of valuation uh, and, and uh, you know, this was not something that was done intentionally by Mr. Goldman, and the court uh, allowed uh, Mr. Goldman to consider the fact that in terms of equitable distribution that he made some efforts to keep his company alive and it failed. Um, and, and so we're, we're, we're sort of, I, I would say, in a, in a world of, of Goldman type events here with COVID-19, uh, not due to uh, a financial failure of the, of the basics of the business, but due to uh, external events, which has, have affected virtually every business in one way or another. So that is the concept of known or knowable. <clears throat> um, all valuations are predictions. All valuations are a prediction of future cash flow. Um, and in fact, 
um, a very simplified, very basic definition of what is a business worth. It's worth the present value of the future cash flows discounted to the present using some kind of a, a, a risk-based discount or capitalization rate, which is all based on one's uh, assessment of the overall risk involved, both systemic risk out in the marketplace and the particular risk to the company, et cetera. Um, so, so now we now we've got these predictions of of what potential cash flow is, um, and it's now intersecting and colliding with uh, the realities of a world that is large is is in many ways shut down for many businesses. Okay, so let's take let's take a hypothetical. Let's say we're valuing a company in, in 2020, uh, and let's say we have a 12-31-19 valuation date, uh, simply because that's the date closest to the date of complaint. And, and for those of you that don't know, in, in New Jersey, the date of complaint generally will determine the date that we value the business. Um, um, and let's say this business is a personal service company and was forced to close under the New Jersey lockdown rules, which came about the second or third week uh, of March of 2020. And absent COVID, the company was appraised at $1 million. So, so query, should, should COVID influence the business valuation? Was the COVID pandemic known or knowable as of 12 31 19? Um, so a lot of people that are a lot smarter than, than me have done some research on it and, and there are different theories of when, uh, when the, when the marketplace can sit, or, or when, when we can consider some, consider COVID to be known or knowable. And I'm just going to give you one theory based on a company called Valuation Products and Services. It's run by Jim Hitchner. Um, and Jim and his group um, looked at what happened out in, in the marketplace in terms of the, of the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, et cetera. And without getting too much into the weeds, um, they concluded, and if you look at, look at these drops here, uh, they concluded that on or about February 24th, based on what happened in the public marketplaces and based on President Trump uh, asking Congress uh, for his first response to the uh, coronavirus, uh, which was a $1.25 uh, $1 billion ask, um, that, that has become for many people the operational date of what is known or of when COVID was known or knowable. And of course, one, one can argue infinitely, you know, how many angels fit on the head of a pin and choose other dates and, and whatnot. And this is just one illustration um, that I would say is, is roughly, is broadly accepted uh, out there. Um, but at the end of the day, for reasons that we're gonna see, it may or may not be relevant, uh, certainly in matrimonial valuations taking place in a court of equity. Uh, Jeff, there's a question. Sure. Uh, isn't Goldman about a change in valuation date time of trial rather than a use of facts subsequent to the valuation date? Well, in the case of, I, I, I'm not an attor attorney, so I'm going to give you my, <clears throat> give you my non-attorney um, uh, opinion on that. My understanding of, of Goldman is that because what happened was subsequent to the, the date of complaint, the business, uh, if I'm not mistaken, went bankrupt. It's been a number of years since I read the actual case. So yes, at the, at the date of trial, I think that's when the circumstances around that business were considered to be more relevant than the date of complaint. The, and and I'm, I'm hedging a little bit only because I know from uh, my colleagues around the country, uh, I have friends out in, in San Diego, and for example, in, and San Diego County values as of the date of trial for virtually every business valuation. So I just want to draw that distinction. Um, so here we're talking about events in Goldman that arose after the date of complaint, which, which would have been the traditional date of valuation. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered the question. Um, you know, we can talk about that offline if, if someone wants a little more detail about that. Okay. So let's assume that um, February 24th, we'll assume that as, as a working assumption as something as 
when it was known or knowable. Um, and, and so um, we have a situation where, as I said, we, we had, we had a, a million dollar valuation and assume the sales had dropped significantly or worse that the company, that the company closed. Um, and so is, is that 1231.19 value fair to the business owner? Um, and and it, is it fair to the, what we call the quote unquote, the outspouse, the person that's going to uh, get bought out? Um, so what are the what are the technical options available to the to the appraiser in that circumstance? Well, we can revalue based on projections using DCF or the discounted cash flow model. Um, DCFs have a um, uh, somewhat checkered um, reception, and matrimonial valuations are widely accepted uh, in in commercial cases, especially in Delaware in the uh, Chancery courts down there, because it's a very sophisticated courts, uh, very very sophisticated court, and they understand these sophisticated uh, models. Um, so theoretically, one of the options available to us is to try to use a projection of when we think the company is going to come out of um, this downturn in business. And there's a technical, there's a model again called the DCF, which looks at discrete periods of time and discrete cash flows um, and, and actually is somewhat of the gold standard in more uh, sophisticated commercial valuations. Um, uh, so that that's an option. Uh, that in and of itself, un unfortunately, creates its own set of, of problems. Um, and one of those problems that, that we have is that in the world of these smaller valuations that many of us do on a day in, day out basis, management just isn't even capable of making those projections. We're not talking about Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 companies or Russell 2000 companies, which have sophisticated financial and, and accounting departments capable and a history, of course, of and trying to make these projections. So this becomes a real practical issue for these smaller cases that, that we're all dealing with uh, on, on a day in, day out basis. Um, and add to that the the fact that we have no historical precedent unless we go back to the Spanish flu in uh, what was it 1918 and unfortunately we don't have a lot of uh, very good financial records uh, available as, as we do today so we really don't even have um, historical precedent in terms of trying to make a call uh, in terms of of, of what of uh, of what these numbers might might be and how the company might be coming out of its its current downturn. Um, so another way of of looking at it are are prior financial contractions reasonable to use as a model? When does the company begin to rebuild? When does the company begin to stabilize? Twenty in 2020, 2021, 2022. And then another, another input into that whole thinking is which virus model do we want to consider for future planning? And if we look back into what we thought was going to be the case back in March and what we're living under now, um, this, um, a lot of those models, for whatever reason, uh, have, have not really panned out in, in, terms of act, in terms of the reality. Very briefly, we can look at we can look to market crashes. Well, 1929, most experts consider um, uh, that crash to have taken 25 years to recover from. Uh, in 1987, if you remember, I think it was, was it called Black Monday, uh, it took about two years uh, to to recover. Uh, the dot com crash in 2000, uh, most experts say it took about seven or so plus or minus years to recover. And then, of course, the, the last big crash we had was 2008, and that took somewhere between five and six years to recover from. Uh, COVID-19, 2020, years to recover? I have no idea. And frankly, I don't think any, any of the uh, you know, people, whether it's at the Federal Reserve or in, in private equity markets, I don't think people really have any idea of how long it's going to take to recover. Um, and, and of course, this is just adding to, uh, you know, greater uncertainty in the marketplaces and, and greater difficulty for, for the work that, that, that we have to do. Okay, so 
briefly, and again, without getting too much in the weeds, um, uh, you know, which virus model uh, do, do we want to consider? And I understand that, that this is pretty technical stuff, but I want, but what I want would like you as the non-technical audience to, to get an appreciation of is what, what we have to consider when we're looking at the, the whole gestalt of valuing a business. And as much as I'm not, certainly not an epidemiologist, I have to try to factor some of this information into my thinking when I'm looking at a particular business. Now, back in May, um, I subscribed to something called Stat News, which uh, uh, is pretty well respected, nonpartisan, and stays current on, on a variety of health issues. And is, of course, has been consumed with the COVID virus uh, since, since, since March. And back then, they had the, you know, they ran their own analysis, which was based on studies that came out of SIDRAP, which is at the University of Minnesota. And if you spent any time on CNN, you might have, you, you've seen Michael um, Osterholm. Uh, he's the director of SIDRAP and, and he's a pretty prominent epidemiologist and he's been on CNN probably once a week, if not more, so probably since, since March. Um, and his group came out with a study and they, they looked at, well, what are the different scenarios? Uh, are we gonna have peaks and valleys? Are we gonna peak in the fall? Are we gonna have a slow burn? And, um, you know, you, SIDRAP back in April when they did their study said, well, well, now we know scenario three was clearly wrong in hindsight, okay? Um, you know, by mo most experts now say the slow burn ain't gonna happen. We're in various surges. And when is all of that going to end? And are we going to have this second surge, you know, coming up uh, in the fall with, a, with the confluence of um, uh, um, the, the flu and pneumonia and all the rest of that? So uh, you can see we've got all of these experts out there, whether they're in the financial world or the world of epidemiology, and everyone's disagreeing with each other. And we're all trying to figure out how to do things in the here and now. Um, there's some interesting information here. You're welcome to take a, a dive into if, if you're interested uh, when, you, when you get the materials from Carl. So from a practical standpoint, what do we do? Well, we can, as I said, we can go back and try to build a model. And this is just one of many infinite variations. We can say, okay, do we expect uh, the financial impact to be slight for a period of less than six months and then medium six to 12 months, maybe more severe after 12 months, uh, one out of many, many uh, scenarios. Uh, and let's say we arrive at three different values uh, based on our, our assessment of, of the severity of, and, when, and when, when companies will come out of the, the severity. And let's just say we ran our models, we ran our numbers, and we have three different scenarios with three different values ranging from $500,000 to a million to a million five. <clears throat> so we can certainly present a range of values, um, but I would say that, at least in my experience, courts and, 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 and the litigants themselves and their attorneys want to see a single value um, outside of a, a setting, although in a setting like mediation, we, we have a lot more flexibility to work with a range, but many people would like to say, okay, at the end of the day, Mr. Erback or whomever, you know, wh what is the value? And then we'll work off of that, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so, you know, how does, the, how does the couple in the court deal with this range of values? Um, and all of these values, of course, are built on assumptions uh, for a world that we, none of us have ever seen. And, and one of the problems is that in moving, uh, if I were to, say, if someone were to say to me, okay, that, that's very nice, Jeff, that's that range, but give me a single point value. Uh, I now have to delve into the world of statistics and probability and try to figure out, uh, you know, statistically where things are going to fall. And I'm not going to bore you with these details. If you, if you had any statistics in college or whatever, you know of normal distributions. And I can tell you that one of the problems that we have is that, as I've learned in doing this research, is that pandemics are not normally distributed. They have a fat tail. 
And that's very unfortunate because what that means is that there's lots of people dying both before and after the, the, the statistical, we, we don't really know, I should say, what the statistical mean is in these things, which makes all of this incredibly, incredibly difficult uh, for us to do. Okay, so just changing gears a little bit, other things that you may not even have thought about, but that are, are going that are going to be affecting valuations are accounting for PPP loans. And I'm assuming most, if not all of you, know what, you know, have some experience with these PPP loans, maybe even for your own uh, practices. Um, and so this has to be factored into the valuation as well. Um, so we need to make, we, those of us doing this work need to make adjustments to the bottom line for these, for this one-time non-repeating events. Um, we also, in our overall assessment of risk, need to take a look at the discount rates that, that we're going to be using. Do we increase it? Uh, and if so, by how much? And, and perhaps even for, for how long? And then we get into these time models of cash flow, which is the discounted cash flow or the DCF method, which I, which I mentioned earlier. So uh, all of these things, um, all of these things are 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 uh, questions and 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 problems that that we all need to deal with and ultimately come to some resting place on to try to come up with 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 a with a number. Um, okay, so dealing with uncertainty. So now, now income for spousal and child support has long been subject to change. Is the, you know, the Lepis motion, the, the idea that someone can go in and make an argument to the court uh, that there's been changed circumstances and argue either for an increase or a decrease in whether it's um, um, spousal support or child support. Um, and, and the courts by precedent have long been open to that. Well, the courts, in my experience, uh, as I, and, and from feedback I've gotten over the years from attorneys is so, traditionally courts are not really so open-ended on equitable distribution. They pretty much like to have that um, uh, tie severed, so to speak, and establish, and, and, established, um, and that it, that creates a challenge in today's environment and, and with the uncertainty that, that we're living with. So what I'm positing here in, in today's you know, short presentation um, is that maybe it's time to change that mindset. Maybe notwithstanding the fact that, yeah, it makes sense to, you know, to, to have this couple really separated and to have the least amount of uh, further post-divorce interaction between them, um, maybe in the interest of equity, um, that mindset needs to be changed, certainly not permanently, but at least until we come out of the situation that, that we're now in. So in terms of dealing with uncertainty, you know, the business outlook is all over the place. Um, most business leader, leaders are um, looking at and seeing a, a, a much, a, a very prolonged economic disruption uh, and the prospect for a slow halting recovery. Uh, New Jersey biz, uh, recent nationwide increases in the rate of new infections are creating fears of an economic fizzle and dampening the nation and New Jersey's outlook for the rest of the year. So the, these are just two things from, from the press which illustrate uh, the, the uncertainty that we're all living in. And um, it, it certainly, it, it's affecting um, businesses from Fortune 500 down to uh, the shop that, that cuts my hair, or if you look, hasn't actually cut my hair in the last three or four months. Um, so the, this uncertainty is there for, for us all. Um, but so what are our options in terms of dealing with, with, with this uncertainty? So we can consider establishing a pre-COVID-19 value as a baseline. Uh, and we can consider that figure to be aspirational, all right? And then agree on a provisional value, which is based on the known negatives, the no, I'm sorry, the known negatives that we have as of this particular point in time. And that brings us to the last nine or 10 slides, which is really uh, 
uh, when Carl and I were discussing it, which is really what most of you probably want to get to, and that is, so all this is well and good, Jeff, but you know, how do we deal with it, and what, and 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 how do we, how do we address this in in a practical sense? And so, what I'm positing is that we structure an earnout. And earnouts are venerable. They've been around for a long, long time. This is from an old Inc. magazine uh, uh, article dealing with how to structure an earnout. Uh, and I think think this article went back to 2010 or 2011. Um, and talks briefly about when there's a valuation difference between what a buyer thinks a business is worth and what the seller expects to profit, an earnout bridge an earnout can bridge that gap. And and here's how to make a deal that's good for both parties. And that concept is no less true for the world of commercial mergers and acquisitions than it is for a couple that is um, that is separate that that are separating and effectively. Um, the business owner is selling an interest in their in his or her business to the person who will be their uh, ex spouse. So what is what is an earnout? It's really a contingent payment or a contingent payout, which involves shifting some of the purchase price to be paid in the future on the realization of future earnings or some other benchmark of success. Now, this is from uh, Dr. George Geis, who is associate dean of the MBA program at, U at UCLA. Um, the owner needs to be willing to delay some of the price and be aware they might never get it. Um, so take this and put it into the mindset of a couple which is getting divorced. Um, the, we'll call him or her the, uh, the out spouse wants to maximize the value that they're going to be getting. But the reality is, is that in this world, um, that just may not be equitable. Uh, maybe COVID wasn't known or knowable at the time you filed your complaint for divorce. Um, in the world of, of, of equity, is it now fair then to uh, force the business owner to pay out a price uh, which is substantially higher than uh, they might ever uh, might ever uh, might ever get, and, and of course, there's always a possibility that that that, that business uh, will never ever recover, or even worse, uh, be go into bankruptcy. So, um, so this is something that it, it's look nothing is perfect everything has its problems but it's something that in in the right circumstances may 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 be doable for the right couple um so how do we so how do we structure this this earnout what what do the people in the world of m a's do well one of the things that we've learned is that when we when we do this kind of an earnout is that we want to keep it simple we want to make the um uh, the the metrics or the goals that would let's say move it from a lower to a higher price. We want to make them uh, not so esoteric, but something that is that that we can all commonly understand. And common metrics that are used could be revenues, it could be bottom line earnings, uh, and typical earnout periods again in the commercial world are three to five years. Is that appropriate in matrimonial? I have a feeling maybe not, that's kind of really pushing the envelope uh, on, on equitable distribution to keep it open and active uh, for that period of time. But who knows, uh, you know, uh, may, maybe a couple, a couple can agree that three to five years is reasonable under particular circumstances, you know, to, to, to consider. So, Let's look at a hypothetical here. Um, so we have a business value in the day at the value at the date of complaint is a million dollars. Revenues as of the as of that um, business value date are are ten million. Um, at the point of negotiation, let's say revenues has, have dropped down dramatically to four million. Now, I'm, I'm over I'm, I'm oversimplifying things here, and I'm making an assumption here that. <clears throat> excuse me, that, that revenues are a good metric for the business value. <clears throat> that may or may, that may not be uh, true in every business or, indus or, or every industry. So it's, it's just here for illustration purposes. So the parties could very well agree on a, provision, a, a provisional business value for equitable distribution at let's say 400,000. And further, the parties 
my, the parties can often, they'll agree to split that business value, let's say 30% to the out spouse. You know, we all know that <clears throat> generally speaking, uh, the value of a business is not, is not split 50-50, but oftentimes, and I'll throw out a range because I know it does, it varies tremendously, but I want to say anywhere from 20 to 30% plus or minus on either side of that. Um, so that ultimately, of course, gets factored into the, into the equation as well. And the parties, let's say, agree to look back in two years and re in two years and reevaluate that business value. So let's say after two years, revenues have rebounded to six million. And the agreement calls for an increase in the business value from 400,000 to 600,000 based on using our very simple assumption and metric here that, that revenues is a good indicator of value so that this would be a $200,000 increase, of course, subject to whatever split 20, 30, whatever percent the parties had, had ultimately agreed to. Um, and the parties now, of course, really need to pre, they need to pre-negotiate how that additional amount is going to be paid. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, in, in many cases, a lump sum is just not going to be practical. Uh, there's uh, oftentimes in many of the cases that we're in, there's just not a lot of liquidity there. Uh, and then you combine that with the, uh, uh, the, the downturn that, that they're feeling. Um, so we may have a situation where the parties need to agree, pre-agree that if there is this upturn, um, that uh, possibly there'll be a note that's drawn up at some reasonable rate of interest between the parties. And that, that's how the, um, the, the recovery in the business is going to be paid. Uh, and look, having a deferred uh, equitable distribution payout is not unusual. Um, it's not at all uncommon in cases where in high asset cases uh, that, are, that are not liquid, um, oftentimes we, we do have these, uh, we, we do have these situations where um, equitable distribution is paid out over a period of time, uh, oftentimes with a note and oftentimes with, with, with interest. So that in and of itself is not unusual. So um, we have some precedent for, for taking this, um, um, this model from another, another world and applying it to the world of matrimonial valuation. <clears throat> Now, all of that is well and good, but the elephant in the room is what happens rather than revenues increasing, they decrease. And what happens if the business is, has declined? Is the owner now gonna say, you know what? I paid you X number of dollars. I want to claw what we call a clawback. I've now overpaid. So, you know, we've given, we've provided for uh, the outspouts to get an ink to, to get a further payment because the business is, has recovered <clears throat> either in full or in part, but what happens if it doesn't recover? Okay. And I don't have an easy answer on that one. That, that is a tough one. Um, and uh, you know, we, we really have to think all of this through because <clears throat> if we're going to be fair on the upside of the, of the uh, return to value, then we also have to be fair on, on the, uh, the, the possibility or the probability that, that the business will decrease in value or may actually go completely out of business. And so if someone has already made, I'll call it a down payment, so to speak, on that lower value, and now even that lower value has not materialized, um, are they entitled to get something back? Boy, that's, that's a whole new world in the world of equitable distribution, and I'll, and I'll let and I'll, I'll get, I, I would love to get the insight from the the attorneys here in the audience in terms of how of how to do that. You know, quite honestly, it's not uncommon in the commercial world where oftentimes when when a sale is consummated, monies are held in escrow by by either by one or both attorneys just for these kinds of situations. Do we want to start introducing escrow, attorney escrow accounts for business valuations and matrimonial? I don't know. All right. I, I see the problems. I can see the inequities and the equities going both ways. Uh, and so I'm throwing it out here, to, you know, for folks to digest and, and to think about. Um, 
so um, this is something that uh, that that again, uh, you know, party parties need to need to think very carefully about. Um, so we we've we we're running running up on time here. I know uh, Carl wants to leave some time for questions. So we just have a few minutes left here. So let me just say that we've been talking, of course, about companies that um, have experienced a downturn, but um, there are companies that are really that are doing really well uh, in, in this in this environment. Uh, if you're a PPE, PPE manufacturer, if you're doing deep cleaning, if you're a food delivery firm, if you install plexiglass, um, those businesses are doing very, very well, thank you. Um, so the, the, the sort of the opposite needs to be done that in evaluation of such a, an entity and in re, with respect to the fact that, um, let's say, <clears throat> let's say at the date of complaint, this business is, is just doing better than it ever did because it's in this unique, uh, unique a field where they're benefiting from COVID-19. Well, clearly, um, it would be unfair to 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 value that business and and assume that th this level of profitability that has never been been there before and is there solely because of this one-time uh, event of the pandemic. It, it's certainly unfair and unreasonable to consider that that's going to continue ad infinitum. So. We may have that the opposite situation where a company is doing ver really, really well, and we need to dial that number back to some, <clears throat> excuse me, to some level of reality. Um, but that being said, we're still back in that world of uncertainty. How long is it going to be? How long will it be that they'll be uh, that they will be uh, doing you know having this enhanced business and having these enhanced revenues? Uh, and again. It's you're looking at models, you're looking at business models, you're looking at virus models, uh, and of course, at the end of the day, none of us really know. <clears throat> what I would say is this: um, ADR and uncertainty are perfect together. Um, mediation and collaborative law are are perfect vehicles to work on creative solutions uh, in the environment that we, that we're in. Uh, without overstating the obvious, you know, these are unprecedented, unprecedented times. Uh, thinking creatively, breaking away from time-bound practices may be the only way to help couples achieve fairness and equity. Um, it's not easy. Um, nothing uh, that I've posited or, 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 or spoke to today um, is perfect. Uh, and you can take shots at everything here. And, and I'm more than any, anyone well aware of that. Um, I'm just trying to think out of the box uh, and think of how, how and what we can do in, in this environment um, to, um, be fair to, the, to be fair to both parties uh, and to recognize the realities of the, of, the, in, of the business environment, of the pandemic environment. Uh, we just simply need to try to keep an open mind. And I'll just uh, end the presentation with uh, one of my favorite sayings from Shunryu Suzuki, which is, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, and in the expert's mind, there are few. So that being said, that brings us up to where I promised Carl I would stop at about 10 to one, and uh, we'll take some questions, I guess. Carl? Okay, um, let's see, Anju has raised her hand. And so what I'm going to do now is if people want to ask questions, raise your hand and I will click the button that says allow to talk. So I'll do that and then Andrew, you can actually ask your question. And unmute yourself, Andrew, to ask your question. And is she there? She's unmuted. I mean, she's muted rather. Andrew, unmute yourself. Well, she may not be there. Okay, let's see. Uh, other questions? Do, so let me ask you a question. Who presents, you're in a mediation, not you, the couple's in a mediation, and they have this type of situation. 
does the mediator attempt to explain uh, what the problems are, the possible approaches, or is it something that they call in an expert and like you, and then you explain all the options, et cetera? It's a good question, and, and I think it's going to really depend on the comfort level of, of the mediator. Um, you know, um, I, I'm a mediator as well, and so um, I certainly would be comfortable uh, explaining this because it's my happens to be my field of expertise. But um, for for another mediator uh, who, who's not comfortable and has really don't, don't have doesn't have the experience in in this area, then I think they're probably better off bringing in the expert to advise the mediator and the attorneys and the litigants of of what the what the uh, problems are and and the different potential solutions are. And if the solution gets complicated, it's really complicated, like really complicated, it might be likely that the average matrimonial lawyer won't know or hasn't done this in the past and might need to bring in a specialty lawyer, someone who's done that and m and A's, someone who's done structured payouts. Is that a possibility too? Yeah, and I think I would say yes, but tempered by the economics of the case. Um, keep in mind that, um, uh, you know, what I've presented here today may very well be great for a 10 or $15 million company, but not so great for, you know, a company that's doing $100,000, $200,000 a year in whatever field that, they, that they're in. So, um, uh, those cases are even more challenging because the um, the 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 dollars aren't going to be there to cost justify bringing in uh, lots of experts or one expert to do this sophisticated kind of a uh, of a deal quote unquote. Um, so th those are those are probably going to be the more challenging cases to to work with, Carl. Okay, so Anna Marie has a question. Anna Maria, I am going to click allow to talk and then you'll have to unmute yourself. Hey, Anna Marie. You're still muted, Anna Marie. There you go. Hey there. Hey, hey how, Jeff, are, how are you? Good. How are you? Good to hear, hear from you. Good. Um, great presentation. Loved Thank what you. your, loved your train of thought. Thank you. Um, so my question is, is this the talk of the town among your colleagues? Are you all kind of uh, <laughs> chatting about this? Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're throwing this stuff around. Um, uh, it's, I, I would say yes, but I, I, it would be disingenuous for me to say we've all come down on just what the right answer is uh, because we, we all understand how how darn complicated this stuff is um, and the uncertainties involved and you know the this intersection of of uh, of just not knowing about things and trying to craft solutions which are ever are everyday solutions in the world of commercial deals but now applying them in the world of of a matrimonial dissolution this is all new territory, Anna Marie, Anna Maria. And so, um, yeah, we're thinking about it and we're talking about it, but we also recognize how difficult it's going to be um, to implement. And I would also say, as I, meant, as I, as I answered Carl, that um, uh, the practical reality is that it's more difficult, I think, in the smaller cases, in the small dollar cases, uh, because the work that's involved just in the uh, uh, putting together agreements and trying to figure out the, the different metrics to use, et cetera, um, it's just not gonna be cost sustainable on these, on these smaller cases. So I think this kind of solution lends itself much better to much larger valuation situations, much larger businesses than smaller ones. Not sure if that answered your question or not. 
Yeah, no, no, I, I, it, it does partially. Um, yeah, and I agree with you on that too, because uh, you know dollars are going to dictate what a couple can do. Yeah, of course, uh, we don't want to make it more expensive than it has to be. So we can offer them this kind of a scenario. Um, they can go through it formally, or they may be able at least to come up with some numbers on their own mm -hmm. that they can use to put put this all to rest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So okay, thank you. Good. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, uh, we have a question from Adam Berner. Adam, I'm going to push allow to talk, and then you have to unmute yourself. Hey, Adam. Hi, that worked. Jeff, good to see you. Good to see you. How can I? How can? How can we help you? Hopefully. <laughs> um, answering all the qu many questions we have, which uh, are the ones you listed, and I appreciate all the unknowabilities here. So, with regard to in the kind of Comparing to the M and A field, where you're working with that uh, structured earn out model, in that case, I would assume the buying company either continues to pay the person who was bought out uh, as an employee for some period of time, or that person walks away. Um, but in here, you know, the question is post marital efforts. In order to continue uh, keeping that business alive, there are these post-marital efforts that the business owner spouse needs to continue to do. And, you know, in light of the divorce context and how we say that post-marital efforts are really kind of separate property, how does that get put into the mix in terms of this um, payout factoring in the fairness of, you know, this spouse now maybe working 23 hours a, a day to keep this alive all after the, uh, after the divorce? That's a great question. Um, let me... Let me say this. Um, if we, in one of the examples that, that we talked about, we, we said, let's assume that the value was a million dollars before COVID. That became, an, so that becomes an aspirational value. So I, I guess one could make the argument that if, if we're going to uh, tentatively schedule, tentatively settle the case at a lower amount subject to, to that amount going up. <clears throat> yes, it's due to post, to a certain extent, it's due to post-marital efforts. But we, on the other hand, we do have a, a, a top value, that aspirational value, which, <clears throat> pardon me, which we knew was there at one point in time. So that, you know, does that mitigate that, you know, the, the you know, mitigate or not, that that the legal issues of of post <clears throat> excuse me of post marital efforts I don't know it's a good question Adam um, uh, I I think uh, I think one would have to um, say yeah there's post marital efforts involved but we're gonna we can live with that to try to get some equity here um, and let me just add one one other thing um, you know. There, there's this common uh, idea in, in that, well, post-marital earnings are not to be considered uh, for various and sundry things. But the reality is, is that every valuation that we do considers post-marital earnings because v companies are valued not, not on past earnings, but on their projection of future earnings. So there's really a disconnect in the, in, the, in, the, in the minds of, I would say, in the mind of the court, in many of them, uh, in the unsophisticated courts, about what valuation really is. Valuation, as I said when we first started this presentation, is all about future values discounted back to present values, not past values, which are done with and we're never going to recoup. So we're always really looking at future efforts and future values, in a sense. So, would you okay. would you say as an approach, Cox, I ask a follow-up question? Um, yes, if it's a quick question. Would you say that along the lines of what you were suggesting, that if, if there's maybe a, a lesser value because of what's going on, a work off of that value, but then the upper limit value would be maybe based on an established value but for COVID, and that would be the upper limit that would be divided. It wouldn't be more than that. And oh, yeah. that the approach would deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly we want to have that upper value because anything beyond that, you know, w would cl <clears throat> clearly be um, due, to, due to these uh, post-marital efforts over and above a recovery from COVID. Thank you. 
Jeff, uh, I want to thank you very much for what was a very understandable presentation. <laughs> so I really appreciate that it was understandable. Okay, now, thank you. This is the last of our presentations until September. And let me tell you a few things that are going to be happening after that. So starting in October, we're going to have a special series of seven webinars that will uh, qualify for CLE credits. So if you're going to need CLE credits, please stay tuned. This will be announced uh, within a few weeks. Uh, in September, we're going to have three programs. One will be another tech time. Uh, hopefully, we're going to start our um, mock mediation role play uh, series, which will have featuring uh, mock mediations both for divorce and for civil. So that should be pretty interesting. And hopefully we're going to have a webinar on uh, online and in-person networking. So that's going to be in September. The CLE series will start in October. So um, I wish everyone a happy summer. Stay healthy. And thank you again, Jeff. It was really a very, very good presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. Carl, I'll get you the PDF and uh, I'll leave it up to you then to, to distribute it to uh, those folks that would like a copy. Will do. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great summer. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.